Okay. Yeah. We'll get started. It's an honor and a pleasure to have Dr. Raul de Franza, who's the, who's the uh, um, chief of, of uh, diabetes, both the um, university and uh, and the VA, uh, and um, many of of the things that we know about the pathophysiology of diabetes and about the effect and effectiveness of the therapies that we currently use is things uh, uh, to um, his vision and uh, his research. So today he's going to tell us uh, about um, the uh, uh, ways to prevent diabetes uh, and ways to treat diabetes based on the pathophysiology of this disease. Good. Okay, so uh, we can do this informally. So as we go along, if there are questions, you can uh, yell, you can scream. <coughs> Don't throw food. I just bought a new tie, and I want to wear it more than once uh, before it goes to the cleaners. <coughs> so, of course, the best thing to do is not develop diabetes. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I think there now are a number of interventions that uh, we can uh, institute at an early stage this so-called pre-diabetic stage of IgG or IFG that will uh, prevent people from progressing uh, on to uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, but I also might say that uh, the distinction between pre-diabetes and diabetes is somewhat artifactual. So the American Diabetes Association has set a, a certain glycemic endpoints that if you do our glucose <coughs> uh, gets above 140, it's less than to 100, you have IgT. If you're fasting glucose between 100 and 125, you have IFG. But as I'm going to show you, people with IgT and IFG really have all of the same pathophysiologic disturbances that, that folks with type 2 diabetes have. So uh, although we're going to talk about prevention of diabetes, basically pre treating pre-diabetes, in my opinion, is really treating uh, diabetes. So. <clears throat> this is a, a, an old study. Uh, it's actually one of the first natural history studies that uh, was performed uh, looking uh, at how people progress from normal glucose tolerance uh, to uh, impaired glucose tolerance <clears throat> to overt diabetes. And this is a study carried out in Europe with uh, Jean-Pierre Felbert. And the participants in this study were uh, strange uh, folks. Uh, by our standards. They were Swiss people. Remember, the Swiss people are so strange that they're not even part of the European Union. <laughs> and the, the other half of the people with French were French. They're even stranger than the Swiss people. Uh, so this is a typical Europoid uh, uh, population. And all of these people had an oral glucose tolerance test uh, to, of course, measure their s glucose tolerance status. And then during the OGDT, we measured the glucose and insulin levels. So in the bottom panel in orange is the mean glucose level during the OGDT. Uh, you can see it's about 120 milligram per deciliter. In the top panel uh, in uh, green is the mean insulin response during the OGDT. Uh, so we measure the insulin uh, at baseline and then every 15 minutes for two hours. We're simply going to take the mean insulin level. Uh, it's 60, about 60 microliters per ml. And then on a separate day, everybody came back and had a euglycemic insulin clamp or we're going to infuse insulin uh, at a, a given rate. The infusion rate is the same in everybody, so we're going to raise the insulin concentration in the blood to the same level. And then using radioisotopes, uh, radioisotope glucose, we're going to very precisely quantitate how much glucose is taken up by all the tissues of the body. And I'm not really going to go into the isotope methodology, except that it's uh, pretty much the gold standard now for measuring insulin sensitivity. and the first yellow uh, dot uh, is the rate of insulin-stimulated glucose uptake. It's uh, about 300. The units are not important, but they're a milligram per meter squared per minute. What I really want you to do now uh, is now to compare what's going to happen uh, as we uh, start to look at people who are overweight, uh, and then people who are overweight and have varying degrees uh, of glucose uh, intolerance. So we look at people who are obese, but who have normal glucose tolerance. Of course, uh, in the bottom, in orange, their mean glucose level during the OGDT is the same as the lean controls, uh, because by definition, they have normal glucose tolerance to get into the study. Uh, in the top, if you look at the second yellow dot, 
you can see that they are actually quite markedly insulin resistant. Their rate of insulin mediated glucose metabolism is about 200, uh, so there's about a 35% decrease in their insulin sensitivity. But as I said, they have normal glucose tolerance. So why is this? Because you can see in the top panel in green, the beta cell can precisely read the severity of insulin resistance, and it will augment its secretion of insulin to offset uh, the severity uh, of insulin resistance, and you maintain normal glucose tolerance. Now, if you f continue to follow these obese people through life, as uh, uh, Professor Feld there did for the, over the next eight years, you find that these obese people start to develop impaired glucose tolerance. So in the bottom in orange, you can see their mean glucose level is no longer completely normal. It's about 160 milligram per deciliter. So we can ask, why have these people now progressed from NGT to IGT? So again, we look in the top panel at their insulin sensitivity, the, uh, will be the third yellow dot now on the curve. You can see now they are even more insulin resistant. Their rates of insulin-mediated glucose metabolism are about 100 to 150. Uh, so they have about a 60% decrease in their insulin sensitivity. And uh, we'll come back to this, but at this point, they are maximally insulin resistant they are never going to get more insulin resistant. So when we talk about type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance is present long before you develop type 2 diabetes. In fact, it's maximally uh, exerting uh, itself. So from the pathophysiologic standpoint, people in the uh, upper stages of IGT already have the characteristic defect of type 2 diabetes. But again, their glucose level only goes up a little bit. Why? Because you can see in the top, in, in, in green, their beta cell still has the ability to further augment its secretion of insulin. But now, this individual is in a very, very precarious state because he's now functioning uh, at his maximum beta cell capacity in terms of insulin secretion. Now, another important point before we go on that I need to make is that simply measuring insulin is not a good measure of beta cell function. In fact, it's a totally worthless measure of measuring beta cell function, okay? And I'll come back to that. So, of course, uh, the ability to increase your secretion of insulin to offset the insulin resistance is important, but you should not think that this beta cell is a healthy beta cell because, in fact, this individual has already lost 80% of his beta cell uh, function. So, to reemphasize the first red arrow, at the time of IGT, you're already maximally insulin resistant. And at the time of IGT, in terms of the absolute amount of insulin which can be secreted, you're at your maximum uh, capacity. And then if you follow these people further through life, you can see they become overtly diabetic, the last two dots on the curve, and uh, they become overtly diabetic because if you look uh, in the top, the green curve, which is the insulin secretory curve, their beta cell no longer can maintain this very high insulin secretory rate. So as the beta cell uh, now uh, ability uh, to uh, uh, augment its secretion of insulin is lost, in fact declines, what you see is the glucose level go up. And in fact, there's no further deterioration in uh, insulin uh, sensitivity. And this is uh, something that's not very well appreciated. And uh, when we first tried to publish this, of course we were told this can't be that the people who are diabetic must be more insulin resistant than the people who are obese, but in fact, that's not the case. Or if so, they're only just a little uh, bit more insulin uh, resistant. Now, in the last five to 10 years, we've learned a lot more about uh, beta cell function, and what has become very clear is that beta cell failure occurs much earlier in the natural history of the disease and it's much, much more severe uh, than uh, previously appreciated. And this comes from two very large studies that were actually done here at the uh, VA. Uh, one is the San Antonio Metabolism Study, and the other is the VEGAS Study, which stands for Veterans Administration Genetic Epidemiology Study. So in this study, a very large number of people with IGT-259, and in fact, this is one of the largest uh, aggregates of people with IGT who have been really studied in the sophisticated way, 200 diabetics, and then uh, a group of controls who are matched uh, to the IGT and diabetic population. Just as uh, I showed you uh, from that study in Europe, 
all these people had an OGDT with insulin measurements and they had an insulin clamp. Now, in this study, 70% of the people are Hispanic and 30% uh, of the people are Caucasian. And what I'm going to show you is it doesn't make any difference if you're Caucasian living in Europe, whether you're Swiss Caucasian or French Caucasian, or whether you're Caucasian living in the United States or Hispanic. The pathophysiology of this disease is identical. So here now uh, are uh, the data from the OGDT. So in the left panel is the area under the glucose curve. And to the right panel is the area under the insulin curve during the OGDT. In the European study, I showed you the mean insulin level and the mean glucose level. This is basically going to give you the same information. It's just taking the mean insulin level and then uh, extrapolating it out for the two hours. The first bar are the control subjects. And the units are not important. We're just going to compare everybody to the controls. So here are the people now with IGT. Uh, remember, IGT is your 2-hour glucose greater than 140, but less than 200. So we took the people with IGT and we divided them into three equal tertiles. Uh, 140 to 159, 160 to uh, 179, 180 to 199. And of course, the glucose area of the curve is going to go up progressively. And to the right, what you see is uh, at the first two tertiles of IGT, there's an increase in insulin secretion. But you can already see that in the third tertile, when your 2-hour glucose is 180 to 199, you tipped over the top of this curve. And now insulin secretion is starting to decline. And if we add the diabetics, what you see is this curve looks exactly like the curve that I showed you in those European people. Okay? So initially, as you develop IGT, you're becoming more insulin resistant, your glucose is going up. The beta cell will respond by augmenting its secretion of insulin. But with time, uh, the beta cell can't continue to secrete these very high uh, amounts of insulin. And as uh, the beta cell starts to fail, what you see is a progressive rise in the blood sugar level. And this is the natural history of type 2 diabetes that's been described in all populations everywhere in the world. Now, there are some ethnic differences that I'm not going to go into, but if you look at Asians, people, uh, Chinese people and Japanese people, uh, they actually have less insulin resistant than Caucasians and m much more beta cell failure, but still, uh, in relationship uh, to the insulin resistance, uh, you can't secrete enough insulin to maintain normal glucose homeostasis. Yes, sir? Do you think that the rise in glucose is a result of the, the slowdown in beta cell release of insulin, or is it the other way around? Maybe, the, maybe as a result of the beta cells not being able to secrete so much insulin, the glucose levels increase yeah. or not? So that's a good point, and it's both. Uh, so uh, I will get to this concept of glucotoxicity uh, in a minute. So obviously, uh, a rise in glucose can't start the disease. You start with normal glucose tolerance, your glucose level goes up. So glucotoxicity or high glucose causing beta cell failure can't be the initial cause of the beta cell failure. But once the glucose goes up, high glucose, and there are a number of mechanisms which I'm going to show you by which beta cell failure occurs, but high glucose uh, actually uh, impairs beta cell function, and this has been referred to as glucotoxicity. So it's a sort of a spiral that once uh, your blood sugar level starts to go up, it, of course, is the way we make the diagnosis of diabetes, but now it becomes one of the pathophysiologic abnormalities that's contributing to the diabetes. Not only does it cause beta cell failure, but it causes insulin resistance in muscle and liver, so that's uh, a, a good point. And soon you'll see that uh, in a little bit more detail. Now, what does the beta cell really respond to, okay? If I don't raise your glucose, of course your beta cell is not going to make any insulin. So a better measure of beta cell function, as opposed to insulin secretion, is the increment in insulin per increment in glucose. But in addition, the beta cell has a way of reading how insulin resistant you are. So the ideal measure of beta cell function or beta cell health is to express the increment in insulin per increment in glucose, all divided or factored by how insulin resistant you are. We call this the insulin secretion, insulin resistance index. Some people call it the disposition index. Uh, but this is now a, a, a pretty much accepted as the gold standard measure of beta cell function. And that's what I'm going to plot on the y-axis here. 
against the two hour glucose. The two hour glucose I measure your overall glucose tolerance. So when I do that, let's first start with the people with NGT. And uh, unlike the previous slide, I'm going to take the NGT people, I'm going to subdivide them. So if I give you a glucose load, your glucose goes up, and uh, two hours later it's less than 100. That's as good as your glucose tolerance is going to get. Okay? According to the ADA, in order to develop, quote, IGT, you have to have a two-hour glucose greater than 140. So I've taken these people uh, who have normal glucose tolerance divided into three groups, less than 100, 100 to 120, or 119, uh, 120 to 139. And you can see that whether you're lean or obese, it doesn't make any difference. <clears throat> By the time you're in the upper tertile of normal glucose tolerance, you lost 50% of your beta cell function. So diabetes starts long before you develop, quote, diabetes. Long before you develop, quote, pre-diabetes, okay? Now, the other thing that's important on this slide is that once you take into account the severity of insulin resistance, the curse of the lean and obese people are completely superimposed. So there's nothing funny about the beta cells in obese people. They're not functioning any differently than the beta cells in lean people once you account for the severity of insulin resistance. So let's now add the people with IGT. Divide them into three equal tertiles. What you see is that when you get to the upper tertile, the, the third green dot, your two-hour glucose is 180 to 199. You lost 80% of your beta cell function. I already showed you they're maximally insulin resistant. So if I gave you uh, the pathophysiology and I told you you had a person who's maximally insulin resistant, couldn't get any more insulin resistant, is as insulin resistant as a type 2 diabetic with a fasting glucose of 200, and I told you this person had lost 80% of their beta cell function, what would you say that person has? The person has diabetes. Uh, not according to the American Diabetes Association, but, you know, what does the American Diabetes Association know? So, uh, in my opinion, virtually everything that the ADA has done and said is incorrect. And that's why I have always refused to be on any panels uh, that the ADA sets up. Because I want to make sure that there's at least one voice that can denounce what they say. The ADA is an incredibly conservative organization that's ten years behind everything. Their treatment algorithms for diabetes, their concept about pathophysiology are completely outdated. Their, their, their guidelines in terms of diagnostic goals, in my opinion, are totally uh, incorrect, and their treatment goals are incorrect. Uh, and it's this conservative approach that always puts them 10 years behind, uh, uh, and this is another example, uh, in my opinion, or what they're calling pre-diabetes, which in my opinion is diabetes. Now, if we add the, the diabetics in orange, you see it doesn't take uh, much more loss of beta cell function to go from a two-hour glucose that's, say, 180 to a two-hour glucose that's 350. Why? If you're maximally insulin resistant, you lost 80% of your beta cell function, you're sort of teetering on the edge of a cliff. You have one foot on the ground, the other foot on the side. And a, a little wind blows, and man, you've got to fall a, a mile into the ocean. And that's exactly what happens. You lose another 5% more of your beta cell function, and you go from a glucose tolerance, which looks reasonably good, to glucose tolerance, which looks terrible. Now, in biomedical phenomena, most things don't happen in absolute terms. They happen as a log function. So all I've done is taken the previous data and I've log transformed it. So on the y-axis is the log of that index of beta cell function. Uh, on the x-axis is the log of the two-hour glucose. The NGT people, the yellow IGT people, green, the diabetics in orange. And you can see this is a, a linear correlation. Uh, now, if all of a sudden uh, the color on the slide disappeared, and then I ask you to go up there and show me who are the people who have NGT, IGT, or two, type 2 diabetes. Where would you put the line? I mean, it's very, very arbitrary. Okay? So, like, hypercholesterolemia is a continuum. The higher your LDL cholesterol, the more likely you are to have a heart attack. The higher your glucose, the more likely you are to develop the microvascular to a lesser extent the macrovascular complications. So these cut points that the ADA and the European Diabetes Association come, come up with 
really are very, very arbitrary. In fact, the two-hour glucose of 200 is the most arbitrary uh, cut point that you can have. So where does that come from? There were three very large studies, the Pima Indian study, an Egyptian study, and a study in Europe. And what they showed that is if you had a two-hour glucose greater than 200, 10% of the people had diabetic proliferative retinopathy. So the ADA said, okay, well, that's pretty conclusive. If you have proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you really have diabetes. But, you know, to develop proliferative retinopathy, you have to have your disease for five or ten years before. So their cut point of the two-hour glucose at 200 is really very, very high. It's probably many, many, many standard deviations above where it should be. And if we were to define diabetes on the basis of the pathophysiology, we would certainly not pick 200. We'd probably pick a number of 150 or somewhere in that, in, in that uh, ballpark. Now, <clears throat> uh, even more ominous than the data that I've shown you in terms of loss of function are the, the data that Peter Butler has published. Now, Peter Butler is a past editor of Diabetes, and he's actually a very strange guy with a very strange hobby. He collects dead bodies. So uh, he goes to the morgue, uh, and people have passed away, and he uh, removes their pancreas. And there are very nice optical systems that have been now established uh, where you can stain the pancreas and count the number of beta cells. And you can come up with the beta cell volume. And, uh, of course, uh, he would like to wake these people up, you know, and give them a glucose load do an OGDT and get the two-hour glucose. But despite his best efforts, he was unsuccessful in doing that. So all he can do is get the fasting glucose. So he's classified the people as IFG as opposed to IGT. Now, he wants you to think IGT and IFG are the same. They're not. But by the ADA definition, they're, quote, both prediabetes. So the uh, beta cell volume in the NGT people is shown in the bottom in yellow. The fasting glucose, of course, in the top is normal. But the people with IFG, they have already lost 50% of their beta cell volume. Now, he wants you to equate beta cell volume with beta cell mass, uh, and they're not the same. And I'm not going to get into uh, why they're not the same. Uh, and I don't believe there's a 50% decrease in beta cell mass, but there's definitely a decrease, okay? Maybe 15 or 20%. Butler's going to argue it's 50%. The key point is, whether it's 10 or 15 percent or 50 percent, you've already lost beta cell mass at the time of this pre-diabetic state. So diabetes is starting long before our ADA definition, and now if we look at type 2 diabetics in this third bar, you can see there's an even further in the bottom panel, an even further reduction in beta cell uh, mass. So our, the studies that we've done here demonstrate that at the stage of IGT, you've lost 80% of your beta cell uh, function. The studies uh, of Butler suggest that, that you've lost, I don't know, he says 50%, but I think it's probably closer to 15 or 20% of your beta cell mass. And the implications now for, for treatment and prevention of diabetes are, to me, very clear. The disease starts long before you develop diabetes, so you've got to start to treat before you develop uh, diabetes, and the interventions that we use should be targeting the underlying pathophysiology. So they should be designed to correct the beta cell dysfunction and or the insulin resistance, or preferably both. Now, the sad part of the story is we have no drugs for the treatment of IGT or IFG. The FDA does not recognize prediabetes as a disorder. It has not approved any drugs and probably will not for a while for the treatment of prediabetes. So if you're going to treat prediabetes, it needs to be off-label. So you need to very clearly explain to the patient, you know, you have, quote, prediabetes, this is not diabetes. However, you want to explain to the patient that you have this pathophysiology that's very similar to diabetes, and uh, particularly in high-risk individuals, that you believe that you want a medication above and beyond diet and exercise, which don't work, uh, that you're going to need uh, something to treat your diabetes, and then write it in the chart uh, and make sure the patient reads it, signs it uh, from the medical legal standpoint. So what are the things that cause beta cell failure? 
So we, we'll start uh, uh, at the top, age, okay? So this is something that you all study. Uh, so many, many years ago, uh, when I was uh, at Yale, my very first grant from the NIH was an aging grant. And what we showed as a function of age, your beta cell function deteriorates, you also become more insulin resistant. The point is, as we get older, everything goes to hell in the handbasket, you know? And the thing that is the most disturbing are your joints, okay? Uh, from personal experience. But, but your beta cell function is also deteriorating. The problem with this is that I haven't figured out how you stop this decline, because that would be wonderful. Now, next on the list is genetics. And this is another thing that we can't reverse, okay? So if you choose your parents wrong, you're stuck with it, that, that, that genetic background for the rest of your life. It's not like a ball game, you know, you go down and play uh, baseball on Saturday with a group of kids, your team gets whacked. Then you figure out who are all the good kids, and then on Sunday when you go back, you choose up, you pick the good kids for your team. You can't do that, okay? When you choose your parents and they decided to have you, you're stuck with these genes. So we're slowly finding out that there are a number of genes that have been implicated in the beta cell uh, dysfunction. The one that I think is most clearly established is this gene, TCF7LT2. Uh, and uh, this gene is uh, involved in the Wnt signaling pathway and it uh, determines how you respond to GLP-1 and incretin hormones. And about 10% of the, uh, uh, the population in various ethnic groups uh, throughout the world have a specific mutation in this gene. And it predicts uh, that you will respond poorly uh, to GLP-1 uh, in laws. So we're slowly finding that most of the genes that have been linked to type 2 diabetes are transcription factors that have an effect on the beta cell. Uh, and of course, we'd like to be able to uh, revert things back to normal, but I think this uh, genetic engineering is still quite a ways off. You know, people talk about it, it's catchy. And, uh, people were talking about it, you know, when I was a medical student. Still hasn't caught on. I won't tell you how many years ago that was, but it was a lot. Now, next on the list is insulin resistance. So when your beta cell is overworked and it has to continuously pour out enormous amounts of insulin, uh, your beta cell uh, uh, it tends to fail. Uh, and uh, most people say, okay, this is just, you put a big demand on the beta cell, and quote, there's beta cell stress. And in animals, actually, uh, there is this endoplasmic uh, reticulum stress response, which has been shown. Uh, and if you look at uh, people who are going to develop diabetes, what you find is their beta cells are degranulated and they're, uh, 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 they're loaded with lots of uh, pre-insulin precursors, like pro-insulin. Uh, and uh, these peptides uh, have to be removed uh, by the ER stress pathway, uh, and if they don't, they accumulate, and they can cause beta cell dysfunction. Now, I would say if you are a rat or a mouse, this is very well established. The only rats in my practice are called lawyers, uh, <laughs> and uh, whether this response is present uh, in their beta cells remains to be uh, seen. And Debjit is in fact tried to induce this uh, this uh, stress response in a number of ways, and uh, I'd have to say, at least acutely, uh, uh, so by infusing one. glucose or, or uh, FFA, Debjit has not been able to do it, and it may be that it has to be a chronic uh, response to, 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 to get it. But there are other ways in which insulin resistance can be causally linked to the beta cell failure, and one of them is what we call lipotoxicity. So. The epidemic of diabetes is being uh, driven by the epidemic of obesity. And the epidemic of obesity is basically the epidemic of fat overload. So if you eat too much uh, and you now run out of uh, de depot storage in your fat cells, the fatty acids will spill out and they accumulate in all tissues in the body. Of course, if they accumulate in muscle, you get insulin resistance in muscle and liver. You get NASH and insulin resistance in your heart. You have a heart attack. Uh, so forth. But if they accumulate in your beta cells, they cause beta cell failure. Now, so here's a mechanism by which you become insulin resistant. You put fat in muscle. 
and simultaneously put fat in the beta cells. So they're linked. But they're not, in a way, causally linked. It's not the insulin resistance that's causing the beta cell failure. It's the same thing that's causing the insulin resistance that's causing the beta cell failure. Okay? Now, what you were speaking about is next on the list, and this is called glucotoxicity. So, a high glucose can't start the beta cell failure because, of course, you start with a normal glucose. But once your glucose goes up, it can feed back and impair beta cell function. And this has been very well established uh, in rodent models. Uh, I would say it's less well established in humans, uh, and we actually are doing studies now on the Clinical Research Center uh, using medications uh, that block glucose transport in the kidney so that you simply urinate out the glucose and lower your blood sugar level. And so if glucotoxicity is a major pathophysiologic mechanism in humans, by lowering your glucose, you should be able to improve beta cell function, and we'll see whether this uh, pans uh, out. Amyloid deposition. When you secrete insulin, you secrete amylin in a one-to-one -one ratio. And when you break down the amylin, you get these small peptides which are incredibly toxic uh, to the beta cell. And the person who's done the most in this area is Steve Kahn, who's at the Washington VA. And so here's another mechanism that will link insulin resistance with beta cell failure. So you're insulin resistant, a signal goes to the beta cell, secrete more insulin, but now you're secreting more amylin as well. So it's the amylin or the degradation products which are injuring the beta cell, not the insulin resistance, but they're going to be linked. And then lastly is the incretin uh, effect. Uh, so there are things, uh, there are two incretin hormones, GLP-1 and GIP, uh, which we'll talk about a little uh, bit uh, longer. Uh, but there's resistance to both of these incretin hormones, and there's uh, some mild deficiency of GLP-1. Now, I could expand this list. I could add a whole bunch of it, you know, inflammatory cytokines, TNF, alpha, interleukins, uh, etc. So there are many mechanisms uh, by which you can cause beta cell failure. But the fact is, in any given individual, there's no way you can sort out which one of these mechanisms is the predominant mechanism. So, for instance, one of the studies that we're doing upstairs is to take diabetics, lower their glucose with dabagliflozin. So that will tell us what component is due to glucotoxicity. And then, in these people, then we're going to add on a sipamox. So that will tell us what is the combined effect of, quote, lipotoxicity, or at least elevated plasma FFA, and elevated glucose. Okay? And there's still going to be a lot of beta cell failure left, uh, and how much of it is due to these other things is very, very difficult uh, to sort uh, out. Now, the other part of the story, we've talked a lot about beta cell dysfunction, is insulin resistance. Okay? So if you're, you are insulin resistant in muscle and liver, okay, this is going to uh, also predispose the development of, quote, prediabetes and eventually diabetes. So... Uh, we have drugs that will attack the insulin resistance in liver, metformin and TZDs. We have drugs that will attack the insulin resistance in muscle, primarily the TZDs and to a lesser extent metformin. And we have drugs that will work at the level of the beta cell uh, in terms of the TZDs and the equitin uh, mimetic uh, drugs. So all of these are potential medications that could be used in the pre-diabetic state. So what now uh, what are the clinical evidence? What is the clinical evidence that you can intervene, either with lifestyle modification or with pharmacotherapy, to prevent the progression to type 2 diabetes? Well, there have been a number of studies that have been carried out. This list is uh, pretty good, but it's by no means exhaustive. There are three studies with metformin, a study in China, uh, the Indian uh, in, in Asia, India, uh, diabetes. DPP, and then the U.S. Uh, DPP. Uh, the Diabetes Prevention Program in the U.S. is the biggest one with over 2,000 uh, patients. And the last column is the only one that you need to focus on. This is the risk reduction of developing diabetes. So metformin was uh, very robust in Chinese, decreased the incidence of diabetes by 77%. In India and the U.S., the data are much less uh, impressive. 
Uh, and this may have to do with the difference uh, in the etiology, as I referred to earlier, uh, of type 2 diabetes. We have many, many studies with TZDs. I would say that the best data we have are with the thiazolidine diones, uh, the diabetes prevention program, uh, tripod, bipod's not up there, DREAM, ACMAO, and you can see the risk reductions are anywhere from 50 to 75%. Uh, so the data with the TZDs, in my opinion, are the most uh, impressive. Stopnidum was with Archivos, uh you know, uh, I'm, I'm not very impressed with the data, quite frankly. Uh, and this is a drug that uh, is uh, not really uh, achieved much success in the United States. It has a lot of GI side effects. Uh, but it seems to work well in some populations, particularly in uh, Orientals. And we have Orlistat, which is a, a lipase inhibitor, uh, uh, the Zendo study. Uh, and uh, we now have uh, some preliminary data, which I'll share with you, with uh, both exenatide and uh, Lira Lutide. So the first big study was the diabetes prevention uh, program. Uh, so in this study, there were uh, over 3,000 people in the, in the three main arms. Uh, one arm was intensive lifestyle. The other was what they call lifestyle light, just a modest advice on uh, lifestyle intervention and then metformin. So these people uh, were recruited over one year, then followed for three years. And the endpoint was conversion of IgT to type 2 diabetes. So diet and exercise was very effective. Uh, it decreased the conversion rate by 58%. So if you can get people to diet and lose weight and to exercise on a regular basis, this is very effective therapy. Okay? But I'll come back to this, okay? Most people are not very successful at this, despite what dietitians will tell you, okay? The Cochrane analysis of every dietary study ever performed in the world, okay? These are uh, many, many thousands of people. The average, the weight loss, what do you think it was? You put all of these studies together at the end of one year. 1.7 pounds. Okay? So diet and exercise, if you can do it, is very effective. Okay? The issue is, can you sustain it for a year or longer? Uh, and that's the problem. Metformin decreased the conversion rate by 31%, much less effective than diet and exercise. Proglitazone uh, decreased the conversion rate by 23%. But this is a, an interesting study because Nine months into the study, troglitazone was removed from the U.S. market. So the people received troglitazone for nine months. The study went on for three years. So even though the people had not seen troglitazone for two years and three months, it was virtually as effective as metformin. So the investigators said, well, this is not really a fair comparison of troglitazone and metformin because the metformin people are treated for three years, the glitazone people for nine months. So what they said, what was the longest time that anybody received troglitazone? It was one and a half years. So they said, let's just look at the first year and a half, okay? And if you now look at the rate of conversion, okay, how many individuals converted to diabetes uh, per year? Lifestyle light, okay, where you just were told to diet and exercise had the highest conversion rate. Next is metformin, you can see it cut it, you know, very impressive. Lifestyle heavy, very good. But when you're on the troglitazone, the drug that worked the best was troglitazone. Now, <clears throat> this study went on for three years. So, uh, at the end of three years, there was this overlap period, and then the people were then uh, followed up uh, for an additional uh, five years, okay? If you got placebo, uh, which is basically the lifestyle light group, okay? If you look at their change in their weight, nothing happened, okay? So if you just tell people to lose weight and exercise and you do this for an hour and when they come back, you know, for their three-month visit, you say, you know, are you losing weight? Well, I'm thinking about it, you know. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, metformin, uh, you lose a little bit of weight. And lifestyle heavy, 
would work great in the first year. Even though these people were getting very, very in intensive uh, therapy, and I'll come back and show you what it is, within the first three years, they're still starting to regain the weight. And once the study is over, they immediately go back to where the metformin group is. Okay? It's not sustained once you're out of the program. So, what... Uh, I, did I put it in here? Let me see if I put it in No, I didn't put it in here. Okay. So let me go back to this. So what was the intervention here? They started off with 16 individual sessions, in addition to group sessions. And then... Every month, you met with a dietitian there afterwards, okay? You had a physical trainer who came to your house and checked on you on a weekly basis. You got free passes to the gym so you didn't have to pay. If you couldn't afford to go to the gym, they called a taxi cab to get you to the gym. The nurse and the investigator is calling you like every two weeks. So this kind of intervention is incredibly cost-effective, but it's also incredibly costly to do it. And even though at the end of three years, they actually had a fairly re-institution of the program, you can see they still gain uh, weight back. Now, here's the real killer in this study. Even the people who lost weight, 40 to 50 percent of them still went on to develop diabetes. So there are two problems. Number one is, can you get the people to lose weight? Okay. But even if they lose weight, about half of the people are still going to progress to diabetes. So weight loss is not the end all, or weight loss plus uh, exercise. So there was a Finnish diabetes prevention program that was carried out, which is the parallel of the U.S. program. Uh, another one of these intensive things that no one in the world can do. So the Finnish government said, okay, Finns are crazy, we can come up with a moderate intensity program, and it will work, okay? So they've recruited 10,000 uh, high-risk uh, individuals for uh, diabetes, and the one-year data were just recently uh, published. Okay? Now, these people had individual or, uh, counseling as well and or group uh, counseling. Uh, and again, uh, there were about 10 individual sessions uh, to start this uh, thing off uh, uh, using behavioral modification, uh, they were also given an exercise uh, program, uh, and uh, the one-year follow-up in terms of weight is shown here, okay? So, what percentage of people lost any weight whatsoever? One-third of the people, 34.3%, okay? <clears throat> you can see about 18% of people lost more than 5% of their body weight, then uh, another 18% lost between 25 and 5%. So this is in Finland where these are uh, exercise fanatics, okay? Then what percentage of people lost no weight? 46%. What percentage of people gained weight? 20%. So the point is, it doesn't make any difference where you are, whether you're in Europe or in the United States. Weight loss, if you can do it, is great. But the fact is, it oftentimes does not succeed. In fact, more often than not, it does not uh, succeed. Okay? Now, why is it that you can't succeed? You cannot succeed because the physiology goes against you. So, there is this concept that people have talked about, which is your set point for your body weight. Uh, and everybody in this room who's tried to lose weight knows that you can lose weight, and then you tend to gravitate back to your old weight. And it, this sort of nebulous term that we all have a set point in your body weight uh, sort of got generated. So this group in Australia uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, see if, in fact, if you could get people to really lose weight, would you reset the set point? So if I put you on a crash diet and I got you to lose a lot of weight and I were able to keep the weight off for a year, would you reset? So this study was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, uh, I think it was December. So they looked at 50 non-obese, uh, non-diabetic uh, obese uh, people. You can see their BMI is about 35. They have 50% body fat. So they put them on a 10-week, very intensive uh, intervention. 
uh, it was a very, very low uh, caloric uh, intake. It was about five, 600 calories uh, per day. Uh, and these people lost uh, about 15 kilos. So the weight loss program was very uh, effective. Uh, and the weight loss is shown here. You can see that uh, initially, this big drop in weight, and even though they were, I mean, they were coming back literally every week, being counseled, etc., you can already see that the weight loss is starting to go up a little bit. So it's, again, very difficult to maintain the weight. On the other hand, at the end of the study, these people have still lost about 13 kilos. Oh, there's another slide that's not there. Okay. So then they said, uh, we're going to evaluate, uh, we're going to look at a number of physiologic parameters at the beginning and the end. So they have uh, all of these uh, scales for hunger. That uh, at the end of the year, these people were starving. They were like five times more hungry than when they started. They had uh, about five of these analog scales where they come in and they give you a buffet dinner and they let you choose. The people become like chow hunters, okay? <laughs> and they had a, a, a variety of uh, other tests that they looked at. And every one of these tests said, I'm starving. So you didn't reset. In fact, <clears throat> you were much worse off. So what is the uh, hormone par excellence? that shut your appetite off. It's leptin. So what were your leptin levels? Very, very low. PYY, very low. Cholecystokinin, very low. Amlin, very low. GLP-1, very low. Okay? Ghrelin, which makes you hungry, very high. Okay? So every hormone that shuts off your appetite became almost unmeasurable. And every hormone that stimulated your appetite was sky high at the end of the year. So there's a physiologic reason that prevents you from, quote, resetting. And these people actually, by every scale that they could look at, were starving. And they, they re-eat, and they tend to gain their weight back. We'll give it, yeah. But what if you lose the weight more slowly to begin with? Yeah, they didn't do that. And this, the, uh, the editorial, that's one of the things that got brought out in the editorial. Maybe this is the wrong way to lose uh, the weight. Maybe you should lose the weight slowly over six months and then keep it off at the end of the year uh, and see. But the behavioral modification part of the study would be the same as what would happen if you lost the weight slowly. It was the total number of calories. So that's a, an unanswered uh, question, and that potentially could make a difference. Okay? Now, what are the data the TZDs were? Right. Tripod and pipod, this is troglitazone, pioglitazone. Treat people with IGT, you decrease the conversion rate by about 50 or 60 percent. In the DREAM study with rosiglitazone, you decrease the conversion rate of IGT to diabetes by 62 percent. Now, most recently, we carried out this large study with pioglitazone called uh, the ACNAV uh, study. So we uh, screened 1,850 people to come up with the sample size, which is supposed to be 602, and then they were equally divided uh, into uh, two groups. So Nick and Debjit and myself were uh, the site investigators here. There were seven other sites that were involved uh, in this study. Uh, half the people on PO, the other half on placebo. But in order to get into this study, you have to have a fasting glucose above 95. So we were really picking out high-risk people. Remember, quote, pre-diabetes, your fasting is 100 or above. So uh, if we look at how many people had combined IFG and IGT, is two-thirds of the population, 400. How many people had isolated IGT? Okay, one-third, about 200. So this is a very, very high-risk uh, population. Whoops. Now, in addition, because we, we wanted this really to be very, very high-risk, we said the people, in addition to having a fasting greater than 95, had to have one or more components of the metabolic syndrome or a strong family history of diabetes or a history of gestational diabetes or polycystic ovarian uh, disease or a minority ethnic background, which primarily meant African American or Hispanic. So this is a population that if you have IGT, you're very likely to develop uh, diabetes. So we recruited the subjects over 2.1 years and then we followed them up for an additional uh, two years, 
And after the subjects were uh, recruited, they were started on peel glitazone, 30 milligram per day. And then if they were tolerating the drug, uh, in one month it was increased to 45 milligram per day. If I had to redesign this study, uh, I would not go uh, as high. I would not go above 30 milligram of peel glitazone. Okay? And I would do it, as you'll see later, in combination with metformin. Uh, and as you go to the 45 milligram dose, you're more likely to see fluid retention and fat weight gain uh, at the lower doses, you know, uh, see it, okay? So, what happened in this study? This is the Kaplan-Meier plot at the time to development of diabetes. 7.6% per year people in the placebo group converted to diabetes, that's the yellow curve. 2.1% uh, per year, the hazard ratio is 0.28. Or to say it the other way, there's a 72% decrease in the conversion rate of IGT to type 2 diabetes. So this drug, pioglitazone, is powerfully protective against developing diabetes. But then in addition, we wanted to know, okay, how many people went back to normal glucose tolerance? So in the placebo group, because there was a, a reasonable diet uh, exercise intervention here, mostly diet, 28% uh, of the people reverted back to normal glucose tolerance. In the PL glitazone group, almost 50% of the people went back to normal glucose tolerance. So not only did they not develop diabetes, their glucose tolerance reverted back uh, to normal. Then we had a number of measures of insulin sensitivity, okay? Uh, and I'm not going to go into the techniques. One was uh, an index derived from the OGDT, uh, the Matsuda index that was actually developed here, and we also had another index that uh, we used the Bergman model of insulin sensitivity. So in the placebo group, the, the pre in all of these studies is going to be the dark bar. The post-treatment three or four years later is the light bar. So placebo did not change insulin sensitivity. Okay, pioglitazone markedly improved insulin sensitivity. If we uh, look at uh, the beta cell function, the increment in insulin per increment in glucose, divided by how insulin resistant uh, you are. You can see this went up uh, really uh, quite uh, dramatically. Uh, whether you use the insulin sensitivity index on the left derived from the OGDT or the insulin sensitivity index derived from this frequently sampled IBDTT. So there's not only an improvement in insulin sensitivity, there's a big improvement in beta cell function using two totally different techniques carried out in two different uh, days. But what was the greatest predictor of whether you're going to develop diabetes or not? It was what happened to your beta cell function, okay? So on the y-axis is the change in beta cell function. It's that index. It's the insulin secretion, insulin resistance index, or the disposition index. If the number is zero, it means your beta cell function didn't change. And on the y-axis, I'm going to plot it against the incidence of diabetes, okay? So, as you go, if you start at zero, when you go from zero to the left, okay, that means your beta cell function declined. So what happens as your beta cell function declined, the line is going up, the incidence of diabetes goes up. If your beta cell function really declined a lot, 12% of the people develop diabetes. Look at the opposite direction. Start at zero and go to the right. If your beta cell function improved, the line is now going down. So if you get a big improvement in beta cell function, virtually none of the people develop diabetes. So the greatest predictor of whether you're going to develop diabetes was that index of beta cell uh, function. Now, number needed to treat. You need to treat 18 subjects with IGT for one year to prevent one case of diabetes. Okay. So how does this stack up with statins? How many people do you need to treat with a statin for one year to prevent one MI? About 40. Okay. This is actually better than a statin. So people say, well, you're going to have an MI, you can die. Well, that's true. You can develop diabetes and go blind and have a heart attack and stroke and go on to dialysis. That's not so good either. So I would say that this is a cost-effective treatment, except the cost of pioglitazone is expensive. If pioglitazone were to become generic, 
as I will show you in the last slide, it is cost effective in absolute dollars. And in fact, it's one of the few interventions that in absolute dollars saves you money. So how do I know that? Because metformin in the diabetes prevention program over 10 years actually saved dollars. And remember, the conversion rate uh, uh, or the decrease in the conversion rate was 31%. The oglitazone in this study decreased by 72%. So if metformin, if pioglitazone were to go generic and the cost of pioglitazone dropped to $4 per month in the state of Texas, as did as it is for, uh, you know, sulfonylureas and metformin, it would be incredibly cost effective. It would be one of the most cost effective treatments uh, we uh, have. Now, I'm going to skip through a few of these slides. Okay. Now, this is the CANOE trial. So, uh, a after we comp completed ACNAM, Bernie Zimmerman in Canada published uh, these data. Uh, and remember, I told you if I had to do ACNAM again, I would uh, have uh, done it a little bit differently. So, this is a, not a big study, but it's very insightful. He did 207 Canadian, uh, uh, Native Canadians. Basically, these are Indians. Uh, and uh, what they did is they put them on rosiglitazone, 2 milligram per day. Now, I wouldn't use rosiglitazone. This is the one that's removed from the U.S. market. So, the, the top dose is uh, 8 milligrams. The top dose of. Uh, <laughs> Pioglitazone is 45 milligrams. They use two milligrams in this study. This would be the equivalent of using seven and a half milligrams <coughs> of pioglitazone. You'd have to take the 15 milligram tablet and break it in half. Very small dose. And they did it in combination with metformin, okay? Uh, 1,000 milligrams per day. Uh, and they followed them for four years. There were virtually no side effects in this study whatsoever. There's no weight gain, no fluid retention, nothing, no fractures, etc. Uh, and what happened in this study? Uh, looks very similar to ACNA, okay? Uh, the hazard ratio is 0.31, a 69% decrease in the conversion rate of IgT to type 2 diabetes. Very similar to the 72% in ACNA. But they did it with 2 milligrams of rosiglitazone and 1 gram of metformin. So if I were to do ACNA again, I would probably use 15 of pioglitazone, one gram of metformin, with the option if the A1C didn't really normalize to go to 30 of uh, pioglitazone. Uh, uh, now, the the last set of drugs are the GLP-1 analogs. Uh, uh, these are the incretin uh, hormones. We have two of them, exenatide and liraglutide. Exenatide must be given twice a day, liraglutide once a day. We hope that Later this month, we'll have Bidurion, which is the long-acting exenatide once a week, approved. Where are we going in the future? There's actually an implantable little mini-pump that works for a year. And I've seen the data from phase two. It's uh, as good as the Rebutide, if not better. Okay? So these drugs are very good for a number of reasons. Because, of course, they're very effective in increasing beta cell function and keeping it there. They lower the A1C in diabetics, and they promote weight loss. Okay, so in the, the diabetic studies, they're all designed in the same way. First 30 weeks you get uh, placebo that's in yellow, A1C doesn't change. Uh, if you get exenatide, you drop your A1C by 1 to 1.2. If now at 30 weeks in the diabetics who are on placebo, I switch them to exenatide yellow, you could see the A1C drops down uh, to the same level that you see with the exenatide, and now here are the three and a half year data. Okay, at three and a half years, if you're on metformin or sulfonylurea, you'd be failing. You'd be failing after a year and a half. Okay, these drugs not only work initially, their effectiveness is maintained for upwards of three and a half years. Okay, so there's, of course, uh, the the implications are. If it's working for three and a half years, there must be a big effect on the beta cell. So this is a study done by uh, Bunk and Honey, and they took 59 type 2 diabetics. Starting A1C is 7 and a half. And then they uh, subdivided them into two groups. Half of the people went on exenatide, the other half went on Glargin. Five minutes. Yeah. So why did they put the people on Glargin? They put the people on Glargin for the same reason that you asked. If I lower the glucose, that's going to make things better. So I'm going to lower the glucose with insulin. I'm going to lower the glucose with exenatide. 
Insulin has no effect on the beta cell, okay? And uh, we're going to follow these people for one year. The A1C dropped similarly in both groups to 6.8. And then they did what's called a hyperglycemic clamp uh, at, at the end of one year. And with the hyperglycemic clamp, they're going to raise the glucose acutely and clamp it at 15 millimolar. And then they're going to look at what happens uh, to insulin secretion. So insulin, when you raise the glucose intravenously, comes out in two phases. In the first 10 minutes, there's a bolus of insulin. Then there's a second increasing phase. Well, in orange, you can see the first phase of insulin hardly has increased at all. In the second phase of insulin secretion, it rises bluntly. If you look what happens with the exenatide, you completely restore to normal first phase and second phase insulin secretion. Now, <clears throat> they also, let me just skip through this one here, in, in a uh, whole separate set of studies now with liraglutide, in my opinion, this set of data is the most impressive study that's ever been carried out in the diabetes field. So liraglutide, it's a once-a-day uh, GLP-1 analog. <clears throat> and in this study, they look at beta cell function using a different technique. It's called the graded glucose infusion of Polonsky. So they're going to infuse glucose, and every 30 minutes, they're going to increase the glucose infusion rate. So they're going to increase the glucose from 80 up to 240. So when you do this in normal people in yellow, what you see is as the glucose goes up, insulin secretion goes up. When you do it in diabetics, the diabetic beta cell is blind to glucose. This is the characteristic defect in diabetes. You can see the rate of rise of insulin secretion is markedly impaired. And then they're going to take these diabetics <clears throat> and they're going to give them one shot of liraglutide. And the dose is 7.5 microgram per kilogram. So here in San Antonio, 100 kilograms would be someone who would be considered slim probably in our diabetes clinic. So 100 times 7.5 micrograms per kilo is 7.75 milligram. The starting dose of liraglutide is 0.6, and then you go to 1.2 to 1.8. This is basically the starting dose. You don't, they don't even recommend you use the starting dose after one week. When you do this one injection, and now you have a normal beta cell, there is absolutely nothing in the world which will do this. This, in my opinion, is the most impressive study ever carried out in the diabetes field. I have taken a beta cell that's sick. It's the cause of your hyperglycemia. And in one shot, I've corrected it, the function completely. There's nothing other than this class of drugs that will do this. How long do you do uh, Well, this study went on for three years. And for three years, it kept it... And that study went on for three years. So, you know, pharmaceutical companies don't do studies beyond three years. You're lucky you can get a three-year study. Uh, because once the drug is in the market, there's no benefit to them for uh, continuing uh, the study uh, on. I'm going to skip through a few of these slides. Okay, come back to this one. Hold on. So, <clears throat> what happens if you do this in people with IgT? So they, 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 as part of, this drug is also being developed for weight loss. So as part of this weight loss program, in a phase two study, they recruited 564 obese subjects. Now within this obese group, 31% had, quote, prediabetes. A quarter of them had the metabolic syndrome. And they treated them for 20 weeks with liraglutide. So what happened during this 20-week period? Okay. Well, 61% of the people lost greater than 5% of their body weight. This would get the drug approved for, for, for obesity. Okay. Ten, greater than 10% of the body weight, which is very impressive, is 19% of the people. Pre-diabetes went back to diabetes in 90% of the people. Not that they went on to develop diabetes. They went back to normal glucose tolerance. Metabolic syndrome decreased by 60%. These drugs also decrease your systolic and diastolic blood pressure. They make you lose weight, uh, and uh, uh, they uh, lower the C-reactive uh, proteins. A lot of cardiovascular risk factors also benefited. And all those people had a, a normal A1C, they still dropped the A1C by 
0.2. Uh, so, in summary, what we know is that diet and exercise work. They're very effective as long as you get the people to lose weight. Okay? This is the U.S. and the Finnish DBP study. Metformin works. Okay? Uh, so we have, now with the Chinese study, three big studies that it works. But it's not nearly as effective as the diet and exercise. The best, we have five studies with TZDs. Okay? Act now. Tripod, Pipod, Dream, Canoe, actually six if you put in troglitazone in the DPP prevention study. To me, we don't need any more data with TZDs. They work, okay? And then the GLP-1 analogs, as I've shown you, they look very promising. I think they will turn out to be the best drugs. No one's going to take a shot a day if they have prediabetes. People may take a shot a week. Uh, and people, I think, would accept uh, the implantable device, which is about the size of my fingertip cut in half, and it lasts for a year. In addition, physicians will like that because they get a fee for putting it in. I don't know, it's about $350. They get a fee for taking it out, it's about $250. And then you get a fee for inserting the new one, uh, which is about $300. So that's the last slide that I was going to show. It's a very quiet group. Uh, but I'm more than happy to answer questions from anybody uh, that uh, may have questions. we got time for one or two questions. Yeah, I would say if people have to leave, people can leave. And, uh, they need I, room? And yeah, I can, they, can, they do, but oh, they need room? That's okay. we got time for a question. Yeah. If someone has it. Ralph, on the blue tie trial, the type 2, is there any criteria in terms of the duration of their diabetes? Was that... Considering yeah. all patient selection? No, the, they, none of them were chosen. You couldn't have diabetes to get into that trial. You could have uh, you were obese, okay? Uh, and in, uh, within the obese group, 31% had IGT. So they were just IGT? They were just, uh, yeah, 31%. Uh, there have been a lot of trials that have gone on for two years with their new time, uh, showing preservation of beta cell function. The exenatide trials are uh, three and a half years. Uh, unfortunately, whoever asked me, we don't have data beyond three and a half years. And with TZDs, we have the DREAM study that went on for five to six years. We don't have data beyond five to six years. The NIH is starting a very large study. It's called GRADE. And this is a seven-year study, and they're going to look at combination therapy uh, with all the drugs that are on the market, except now they've decided not to use bioglitazone, which is very unfortunate, because I think that's the best drug. Uh, they haven't decided whether it will be exenatide or liraglutide, uh, but it will be one, it will be a DPP-4, it will be metformin, cell phone, urea, and insulin, and they're going to use all combinations. People will be recruited over two years, followed for five years. Uh, this is now treatment of diabetes. Uh, there is no really planned study for treatment of IGT, uh, and that's uh, unfortunate, but at least we'll get an idea on a long-term basis, uh, upwards of seven years, how effective these drugs are. Right now, uh, a big drawback with all of these studies is that we don't have long-term data. Otherwise, okay. Thank well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've got you under my skin.